Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to be here, mashallah. Um, first thing, I think we should make a clarification. I'm not a sheikh, by the way. Uh, that is either a person who is learned or a person who is old. Uh, and I should say that I'm, I'm neither, rather, a student of knowledge that is still studying, trying to learn the Islamic disciplines. Um, and that is the best way to be, really. Uh, you're either a learned person or you're learning, or you're an ignorant person. There's only three stages or three states that a person can be in. There's no fourth state that is given by the scholars. You're either someone who is learned or someone who is acquiring knowledge or you're a person who is ignorant. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the tawfiq to be either one of the people who are studying, learning or a person who is learned. And this is the state we should always uh, inquire or acquire to be in a position uh, such that we are in the process of learning. Um, Alhamdulillah, we heard some beautiful poetry, mashallah. Uh, Ahl Mahabba, mashallah, are indeed people of love, mashallah, and dispelling love in this community of commentary. It's always beautiful to see homegrown talent, uh, and then for the homegrown talent to be given the opportunity to recite. Uh, most of you probably realize that it was in the Arabic language, with the exception of the last nasheed that uh, the young brother recited for us in the Urdu language. Uh, which not only shows that he is very multi-talented because he knows the Bengali language, the Urdu language, the English language, the Arabic language, subhanAllah, and a very young age, coupled with a beautiful voice, is definitely a bonus, mashaAllah. So these are the people we need to support in our local communities to show that local people can really address the, and keep the traditions that, like uh, the brother before me mentioned, these are traditions from the time of the Prophet wasallam. Today, one thing that you would re recognize is the fact that we don't understand the language. Okay, so if Naat is recited in the Urdu language, most of us don't really understand the Urdu language, or especially the language that uh, is used in poetry, because poetry is a very deep uh, usage of language. Similarly, Arabic language, many of us don't have um, the command to understand the meaning of it. But one thing that we should always remember is that poetry is such that is, that, that is written through love and therefore it affects not only the intellect and the mind but it affects the heart and the souls. So even to listen to poetry who or which we don't have an understanding to is not necessarily a bad thing because it's providing food and sustenance for the soul and for the heart. Therefore it's a tradition we should continue inshallah. The topic that we have today is, is a topic that when we really look into it you'd find people to kind of switch off, people will switch off thinking, yeah, we should do that anyway. But what it is, is it is a science that requires research. It's a science that requires looking into. It's a science that requires us to adapt to the situation that we find ourselves in. So the principles that we take from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and indeed the sublime character of the Prophet ﷺ, is such that can be read from books, but it was in history acquired through the states of scholars. It was acquired in the company of scholars, the company of the learned people. Those people who had such a state that when you be around them, you wanted to be around them. When you listen to them, you wanted to continue listening to them. When you would look at them, you would continue to want to look at those people. You'd, fa you'd feel warmth around those people. You'd feel that there's tranquility descending upon those individuals. All the worries that you would take and sit in the gathering, you'd find that those worries are not disturbing you in your mind. This was the akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ that the companions took in. And when we hear what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with regards to the Quran in, in terms of 
the verse of the Quran which has now been recited twice. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ When we look and analyze this verse of the Quran al kareem you will find that it is almost impossible to translate in the English language. Why? Because each one of the particles that are placed in the Arabic language stress the importance on pun importance upon importance to show the character of the Prophet When you look at the word wa, it is used to create an increase in emphasis upon what is to come in front. When you look at the word inna, it is again telling us that it is indeed and surely what is to come. The word la, which is used before upon, is again used to increase the meaning in the word which is to come after. Allah, which is upon, shows the greatness of what is to come in front. Khuluk is the character and the kasratain in the genitive case that it shows, it, it is also reflective of its intensity of what is to come, which is the character of the Prophet is, is indeed great and beyond the comprehension of human beings. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed this upon the Prophet why? Because he was the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? So that he would exemplify this character in the ummah so that people are attracted to him sallallahu ta'ala wa This was to facilitate people coming towards Islam. And this was not only the natural disposition which is within creation, but it is rather given as gifts of qualities to the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala wa sallam to make him stand out amongst all of the rest of creation. So the Prophet ﷺ was given these characteristics in order to set a benchmark for his followers to try and come close to or try and come and use those characteristics in their own daily lives. So this again shows us something which is very important, that the life of the Prophet ﷺ is a study. is a study through intellectual discourses, through the ahadith, through the narrations that we have, but it's also one that we inhibit from those who are before us through the pious predecessors. So the adaptation of what we have in terms of the greatness from the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, we also attain it from those who are older than us, those who are Im imbued within the love of the Prophet ﷺ. And we see this from the time and the life of the companions One example that we take from Sahih al-Bukhari in Kitab al-Maghazi, a man by the name of Samamat ibn Usal, this was that individual who had great enmity against Islam. He was from the Banu Hanifa tribe in Yemen. And he vowed when the Prophet ﷺ sent letters of invitation towards Islam in the 6th century after Hijrah, he was a person who received the letter and became very <coughs> angered by it. And he vowed to himself that he would go and kill the Prophet ﷺ. To such an extent that whenever he would see a Muslim, trespassing in his land, he would kill those Muslims. And indeed, he had the blood of Muslims on his hand. Then he was going through Medina, and the Muslim army that was guarding Medina al munawwara saw him and arrested him. They took him to Medina al munawwara to the masjid of the Prophet And when the Prophet saw him, the Prophet asked the companions, do you know who this person is? They said, no. The Prophet said, this is Sumamat ibn Uthal. Tie him to one of the pillars of the masjid. And that pillar that Sumama was tied to is still exists in Masjid al Nabwi today. And those people that go to Masjid al Nabwi in the built, which is built by the Ottoman Empire, you see those pillars, each one of those pillars has a name. And from amongst the pillars is a pillar known as the pillar of Sumama ibn Usal. The companions tied Sumama ibn Usal in with this pillar. Whilst he was tied to this pillar, the Prophet وسلم, said that feed Sumama ibn Usal. Sumama ibn Usal got fed. The Prophet وسلم, went to Sumama and he said, Maza indaka? What do you have to say for yourself, O Sumama? And Sumama was the leader of his tribe, a very intelligent man who knew he had been arrested. He said, Indi khayd ya Muhammad, I have goodness for you. In taktul ni taktul da damin. If you want to kill me, then kill me, because I have killed many of your people. In, in tun im, tun im ala shakirin. If you free me by doing me a favor, then I promise to do you a favor in return. Wa in turidu mala, fasal ma And if you require wealth, 
Then ask how much you want and my tribe will pay you for it. The Prophet ﷺ left him for that day, went and came back the next day. The next day the Prophet ﷺ asked him the three same questions again. Sumamat ibn Usad replied with the same three answers. The Prophet ﷺ left him for another day. Same for the third day, exactly the same thing transpired. The Prophet ﷺ went and asked him the same three questions. Sumamat ibn Usalim replied with the same three answers. The Prophet ﷺ said, Atliku Sumama, free Sumama. These are the words of the hadith. Now the point that we need to think about here is what was the wisdom that the Prophet ﷺ tied him to a pillar for three days. In those three days, that Sumamat ibn Usalim was tied to the pillar in the masjid, being fed at its time. What was he seeing? He was seeing the Muslims come to prayer. He was seeing Muslims in the, in the gathering of zikr and azkar. He was seeing the Muslims gathered in order to learn and study. He was seeing the Muslims doing musafaha, shaking hands after prayer. He was seeing Muslims standing shoulder to shoulder in prayer. He was listening to the words of the Azan. He was listening to the words of the Iqama. He was listening to the recitation of the Quran. He was seeing the akhlaq of the Muslim Ummah right in front of him. A person who had a very strong hatred and enmity towards the Muslims and to the Prophet of Allah After three days, when the Prophet asked him to, go, to leave, free him, freed him. He went out of the masjid in Nabawi. He went, made wudu, made his ghusl, came back to the masjid, saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa This was the tarbiyah that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed to Sumamat ibn Uthali that changed his heart for the rest of his life. He said something beautiful after that. He said, Wallahi. <coughs> He said, I swear by Allah, there was no face that was more detested to me than your face. He said, I swear by Allah, there is no face that is more beloved to me than your face. He continued, he said, there was no deen that was more detested to me than your deen, O Muhammad. Today there is no, more, there is no religion that is more beloved to me than your religion. He said, there is no more country or no more city in this dunya that was more hated to me, more detested to me than your city. Today your city has become more beloved to me than any other city. This was the profound effect, the tarbiyah of the Prophet wasallam and the companions upon Sumamat ibn Uthali, that it changed his life completely. This was the character that he saw in the Prophet wasallam. This was the display of the character of the companions which attracted Sumamat ibn Uthalim, which softened his heart. Yeah, a man with a strong, coarse heart has now, made a, has now turned into a soft heart because what he saw appealed to him. What he saw appealed, appealed to his natural disposition which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imbued every one of his creations with. This was what Sumamat ibn Uthalim saw. When we look at further the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Then we have a number of narrations that are mentioned with regards to the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And from amongst those, Qadi Ayyad mentions some of those narrations in the book of Shifa Sharif. This was, a this was a compilation of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and narrations from the ulama and the scholars throughout the time of history that the book in itself is a sign of love for the Prophet This is a book that each and every one of us should try and read. And it was beautiful that as I was coming into the masjid, I saw this particular book, the translation of which was on, the, uh, on one of the boards outside. Again, going to show that this is a book that we need to have in our, not only have in our houses, but also in our hearts. This is where this book needs to come from. So if you look at just a few of these narrations, which would show us the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And the first one is narrated on the authority of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala an fi waswihi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Ali karamallahu wa jul kareem was the cousin brother of the Prophet ﷺ. 
And he says something beautiful. He says, كَانَ أَوْصَحَ النَّاسِ الصَّدْرَ That he وسلم, was the most generous of people. And you find many examples of the generosity of the Prophet which he displayed. There was never a person that left the court of the Prophet وسلم, with a need to even return again. The needs were fulfilled. وَأَصْدَقَ النَّاسِ لَحْجَةً that the Prophet ﷺ was the most truthful in speech. Today, we have to ask our questions these things. What is our character in comparison to the character of the Prophet ﷺ? How, how much generosity do we show and have we shown today? How many times have we spoken the truth and how many times have we spoken a lie? When we stop accountability of ourselves, or when we stop taking accountability of ourselves, then it means that there is nothing that will allow us to rectify ourselves. Then he continues when he says, Alyanahum Arikatan, that the Prophet ﷺ was the most lenient of people, the most softest of people. Wa akramahum ishratan, and he ﷺ was the most generous with his family. Islam gives great precedence to families. And it gives great precedence to joining ties of kinship. And the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated that. And these are important things that we need to revive in our ummah today. Revive in our communities and our societies today. Because family ties is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has joined upon us without us having an option. So these are sacred <coughs> ties and sacred links that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. In another narration which is mentioned, <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam yu'allifuhum that the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam brought people close. Yeah. And this is why I mentioned in the start, as basic as this may seem, <coughs> as simple as, as this may seem, how many of us are reflecting upon these statements? How many of us do ref reflect upon these on a daily basis? And compare ourselves in a way to say that this was the standard that Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set us in a way to show us the right path. <coughs> the right path which is Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Qadi Ayyad rahmatullah mentions in another chapter, he says, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim is the Prophet Muhammad. This is the right path. And this is the way of the Prophet. He brought people closer. وَلَا يُنَفِّرُهُمْ He never drove people away from him. This is why when we look at even the physical qualities of the Prophet ﷺ, they were such that they drew people to him ﷺ. They wanted to be closer to the Prophet ﷺ. As close as they could be. And they wouldn't leave gaps in order to, in order to show their closeness to the Prophet ﷺ. This is why some of the commentators said that if you saw the companions around the Prophet wasallam, that you would think that they are majnoon, in love of the Prophet wasallam. Then, he, then the Shaykh continues, continues and he says, وَيُكْرِمَ كَرِيمًا كُلِّ قَوْمٍ وَيُوَلِّيهِ عَلَيْهِمْ That he honoured every person that would come to him wasallam. So any person from any qawm, any group, any nation, any city, any country, that would come to the Prophet ﷺ, he وسلم, would honor them. Often he would put his rida open out for him and for the delegation that would come to visit the Prophet ﷺ. He would show them honor. Whether they were Muslim or non-Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ honored these dignitaries that would come. Then the Shia continues and he says, Will you have the road nasa? And the Prophet ﷺ would caution people. Again, calling people towards good and helping people abstain from that which is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَحْتَرِثُوا minhum, And he sallallahu ta'ala wasallam would warn people to be careful about their akhirah. Would be careful about the way that they would live their dunya in order for their akhirah. Then the shaykh continues and he says, مَنْ جَالِسَهُ وَقَارَبَهُ لِحَاجَةٍ صَابَرَهُ حَتَّى يَكُونَ هُوَ الْمُنْصَرِفُ عَنْهُ he said, whoever would sit with the Prophet وسلم, or anyone who would try and get close to the Prophet وسلم, for any hajjah that they would have, for any need that they would have, the Prophet وسلم, would show patience <coughs> towards them. 
until the person's need was mentioned to the Prophet وسلم, he wouldn't move away from them. He would never move away from people who would come and express their desire for a solution from the Prophet And these are very, very important traits. Today, how many of people walk away from people that are expressing their need? We walk away from someone who may ask for some assistance, for some nasiha, for some advice, for some help. We just would walk away from that individual. The Prophet ﷺ would never walk away from someone. He would always answer their need. وَمَنْ سَعَلَهُ حَاجَةً لَمْ يَرُدُّهُ إِلَّا بِهَا The Prophet ﷺ would never leave anyone empty-handed. He would always return what they would ask for. Oh, be some, be may surin min al qawl. And if the Prophet, oh, the Prophet ﷺ would say something beautiful to them. So sometimes, if someone comes to us and asks us for something that we don't have, then at least we should reply to that individual with a beautiful statement. Say something nice. Make dua for that individual. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill his haja, his need. <coughs> And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate him from his trial and tribulation. Today when we live in a very individualistic lifestyle, these characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu are very important. To such an extent that the hub of the, masjid, of the masjid was there in order to bring the Muslim community together so that we are able to express our needs and our requirements so that one of the Muslim brothers in our communities is able to help us. This Muslim, this congregational prayer has many blessings so that you see the Muslims every day five times a day if possible where possible so that we are able to share our burdens with one another so we are able to give support whether it's physical or moral support for the trials and tribulations that we are finding outside these are the mechanisms that we take from the characteristics of the Prophet to make ease our affairs of this dunya, of this world. Sometimes coming to the masjid in itself is a way in order to strengthen ourselves. It's in, in a way in order to reaffirm our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why we have this beautiful concept of having handshakes, giving salams to one another after prayer. Things that may seem very basic, smiling at one another, Smiling is sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and we will hear some of those things that are mentioned. Then it's mentioned وَصَارُوا in the فِي الْحَقِّ سَوَاعًا بِهَذَا And another narration that is mentioned وَقَالَ كَانَ دَائِمًا bishop That the Prophet وسلم, was always in a joyful state. Yeah. And this again shows that when a person is linked with Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then under all situations and circumstances, the person will be very content. He'll be very happy within his heart. Knowing that the trial or tribulation that has overcome you as an individual, know that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us solace at the same time when he says, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. That indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't burden the soul more than it can bear. And how much... Uh, serenity and tranquility could we attain from this verse of the Quran or part of the verse of this Quran but whatever we are to face in this dunya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this is well within our reach we can handle this and this can only be done in today's society with the help and assistance of one another taking help from one another supporting one another sharing one's burden these are things today that we have become very far of <coughs> Individually, we have become more pious. Collectively, we have become very, very little in piety. We attained very little in terms of group work. There was a time where people were collectively coming together. There was a time that people would come and do the work in the masajid voluntarily. Today, we have to physically go out and employ people and bring people to the masjids. Today we have to look for teachers to come to our masjids to teach and we pay them and still we don't have teachers. We don't have ambassadors for Muslims. We don't have young role models coming, studying and then teaching our younger ch children coming in the coming generations of this ummah. These are things that are lacking in us today. 
Today we can say to our children, go and do some voluntary work, but how much of the voluntary work are we doing ourselves? <coughs> Today we have access to resources and to knowledge, but what we find is that the amal is very li limited and little in our lives. Therefore, today we can give big khutbahs, big statements, big sermons, but the effect that it has is very minimal and very little. These are the things that we need to go back to. And today we have to go back to the basics. And today we have to adopt change in our daily lives as well. We have to change the methodology that we are using in order to propagate Islam, that we are encouraging our children to study. Our mannerisms in teaching needs to change. Our akhlaq needs to change and adapt to the lifestyle of our children in accordance to what they are, in accordance to the upbringing that they are experiencing themselves. This is akhlaq. But the characteristics that the Prophet ﷺ has shown us, those will exist in humanity until the time of, of, of judgment. They will always be there. That standard has been created. And we need to learn what that standard is and try and apply that in our daily lives. Sahl al-Khuluq. The Prophet ﷺ had a very easy disposition. He ﷺ was very easily approached. He ﷺ was soft in character. Everyone would feel in love in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. He ﷺ would help people of all standards, whether they were rich, whether they were poor whether they were old or whether they were young. And we know how the young kids would hold the Prophet ﷺ by his finger and they would take him in the city of Medina al munawwara Because this is what made the children happy. And this is the important lesson in this that the Prophet ﷺ is giving. That even the heart of a child has a sanctity in Islam. And even when it comes to, when we read the books, Pertaining to funerals, you'd find that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us that when we offer condolences after the demise of the passing away of someone, even the children we should offer condolences to. Such is the care and attention that is taken even with children in the Ummah. Today in our communities, children are the most neglected group of people in our communities. All the elder people are the most neglected people in our communities. We have no infrastructure for, our, for our, our youth and our children. We have no infrastructure for our elders. We have no infrastructure for our disabled people. Disabled people who are unable to come to the masjid on their own, crying every Friday, wanting to go to the masjid, but there is no one to bring them to the masjid. This is happening in our houses, in our communities. Gardens full of hedges. Because there's no one to go and cut the hedges for these elderly individuals. This is a neglect. This is a neglect from our part. Because tomorrow we will be in those states. Is there someone that's going to be going out there to give us a hand? These are the characteristics that we need to revive again. Layyin al Janib. The Prophet was very gentle. And gentleness is something that can change the whole day of an individual. You show, you show someone gentleness in today's time, the first thing that they would probably question is, why are you doing this? This is the mindset. I remember when we were doing the Mawlid in the city, very f and in the Mawlid of the city was an event that we did in order to celebrate the birth of the Prophet wasallam. And Alhamdulillah, commentary was the central point of that, from which is the propagation of this idea continued where cards and roses were given in the city centers across the world. And my experiences were such that if you give a rose to someone, the first thing they will do is they try to walk away because they think that you probably ask them for money. This is now, this is how we have developed as humanity. That even a gentle gesture, people are very cautious about it. People are very reluctant to, to take <coughs> something like that. But that gentleness needs to come back. That softness needs to come back. The leniency needs to come back. And one of the ways to measure that is to ask ourselves, how many a times do we drop a tear for what is happening in this Ummah? 
When was the last time that a tear dropped from our eye because of the killings that we see in this world taking place? When was the last time that we reflected with sadness at what is taking place in the world today? Are we waiting for a trial or an affliction to take place before we, we start crying? Or is there something that we will sit and reflect and ponder over for the Ummah? We have a Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with who would stand in the entire night making dua for this Ummah. Gra showing gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To, to such an extent that his blessed feet would sweat. And when Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala an, anha asked the Prophet sallam, as to his extreme form of ibadah and worship, the Prophet sallam, said, am I not a grateful servant? <coughs> These are the things that we learn from the prophetic life. And today we've stopped teaching our children stories from the life of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala wasallam, and indeed the lives of all the Prophets in Islam. We have amazing stories about Dawood alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, that we need to teach to our children so that they have a love for the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the prophets. And today this is something that we need more so than ever before because there are people that are trying to take that love out of our hearts and they call it freedom of speech when in reality it's hatred in speech and we should condemn this in the strongest way. That this isn't freedom of speech that you can go and hurt a billion people by humiliating the Prophet of Allah or any of the Prophets and then say this is freedom of speech. Even freedom of speech has limits. In order to create harmony in society which is the need of our time today, we need to look at what, is our, what are our common grounds that we can create harmony in our communities in communities which are very mixed, cultural, uh, culturally very mixed communities, we need to look upon our similarities. We need to share the richness in each of the culture that people bring towards us. We have to agree that we are a multicultural society with people of different faiths. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not swear at the God of others because they will swear at your God. These are clear universal messages that are given. So these are the things that we need to look at. Then it continues, Laysa bi fazin wa la The Prophet sallallahu was never of a gruff character. Nor was the Prophet sallallahu of a rude character. Because these are negative or imperfect attributes that would turn people away. Rather there was never a person that turned away from the Prophet sallallahu these were the people that were so intoxicated in the love of the Prophet ﷺ, they would find it difficult to sleep at nights. They would go outside, waiting outside the house of the Prophet ﷺ, waiting for him to come out of his house so they can look at the Prophet ﷺ. Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, he would go wandering in the cities of Medina just to look, find the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said, Lima harajta ya Abu Bakr? Why have you left your house, O Abu Bakr? He said, Harajtul Bayta ke anzura ila wajhi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I left my, haste, left my house so that I may come and gaze at the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were left in their houses feeling that there was something missing in their hearts. And they would go and sit in the court of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was their love for the Prophet And it was this character that created love in their hearts and attracted the companions to the Prophet Those who saw him and those who couldn't see him. He was mentioned with regards to a Hindu. He was a person who was known to make, make sculptures. And he would make sculptures in India of their gods. So someone said to him that you have so many Muslims why do you make a sculpture of the Prophet Muhammad So he said, that's a good idea. I could sell many of these sculptures. So he started to read the Shemail of the Prophet Having read the Shemail, the characteristics of the Prophet he started to make this sculpture. 
As soon as he completed the sculpture, he stood back, he looked at it, and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulullah. Days later, someone saw him and said, Now you've become a Muslim. How come? He said, When I made the sculpture of the Prophet, I thought to myself, If you are this beautiful in sculpture, how beautiful were you in reality? This was the beauty of the physical aspects of the Prophet, but also the, the inner qualities of the Prophet. He was never rude, with his, even with his own wives. He was soft with them, he was gentle with them, he would play with them, he would compete with them in a friendly manner, he would have competition with them. This was how he was in his blessed house. And these are the things that we need to adapt in our own houses. The Prophet ﷺ was never obscene, nor was he exemplary, ex excessively complimentary. And these were just some of the characteristics that are mentioned with regards to the Prophet ﷺ. So these are, and there's many different uh, characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ that we get. But again, we have to reiterate that these characteristics the only time that we will be able to implement them in our daily lives is, is if it's only studied, understood, comprehended, and then acted upon. A lot of these characteristics should be the natural instinct within human beings. The natural instinct within human beings. These characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ was bring, to bring back the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled within our natural disposition we need to read upon them and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exalted the Prophet with such beautiful characteristics. Only then would, uh, would people today look at the Muslim Ummah in a better light. Today, it is no point crying and saying to ourselves that, you know, we're a group of people that are oppressed. Yet there's a lot of oppression that is taking place in the world. What it is, is that we have oppressed ourselves. We have oppressed ourselves, and one of the ways that we have oppressed ourselves is by moving away from the Quran and Kareem and moving away from the Sunnahs of the Prophet. Indeed, if today we want change, change will only come if we change ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Allah la ma hatta ma Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't change the state of a nation until each and every individual changes themselves. So again, the focus coming back is to change ourselves. Change is the, is the key word that we need to take back with us today. And that change is in order to emulate the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and that he gives us tawfiq in, able, in order to be able to study, learn and teach. And also a very important message that I want to give, especially to our younger brothers uh, here, is that we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is that the generations that are before us and the generations that are after us, both of those generations, the responsibility is upon us in order to look after them and ensure that they have a balanced life. So we need to take care of their social needs, welfare needs. This is what a Muslim is. A Muslim isn't a person who necessarily works for himself as an individual. A Muslim is a person who shows concern for himself, his families, his neighbors, his community, his city, and the country that he lives in.